Alright, we're good to go. Here we go, another conspiracy for all you conspiracy lovers. We're gonna be going with James Joyce, the Arabi. Let's go ahead and flip on the lens of structuralism. And let's get at it. Alright, as we see in the Arabi, this is a story that seems to be a coming of age. But James Joyce has a hidden agenda that is woven through the narrative. And he breaks down the social norms using narrology. Man, so three things that are hidden and underlined meaning are going to be humanity and its need for guidance like we all need, divorcing holiness from the Catholic Church, and societal expectation on children, and rushing through childhood. Man, James Joyce knows where it is, knows where the problems are. Alright, for humanity its need for guidance, we have the lack of mentorship for the protagonist allows James Joyce to turn the normative meaning of faith and show what it truly means, the foolishness of the thinker, which causes the protagonist to go on an endless pursuit of guidance. And we have three people we're going to be looking at. We have the uncle, the priest, and Megan's sister, the nun. All right, let's get into it. So we have the uncle, the drunken and uncaring. From James Joyce, page 87, and I quote, If my uncle was seen turning the corner, we hid in the shadows until we had seen him safely housed now looking at this obviously if he's hiding he's already chosen him not to be his mentor it's difficult yeah i get it it's his uncle but he's probably done some bad things and he doesn't accept anymore he's hiding in the shadows he's waiting until he's safely in his house that's the weird part safely in his house what does that mean that means he's unable to take care of himself and that makes him unable to mentor this young child the narrative narrator excuse me now let's move on to the priest this is the interesting part because the priest is talked about in the beginning of the story through three different books three different books this kid looks at i don't know about you but i know if some kids found some books lying on the floor it doesn't mean they're going to look at it but this kid took interest and i quote from page 86 among these i found a few paper covered books the pages of which were curled and damp the abbot are walter scott the devout communicant and the mentors of Vito Ku. I learned the last best because it leaves with yellow. Now, like I said before, no one reads the books unless they're looking for some type of guidance. This is the devout man. This this kid wants to be like him. But he sees that there are struggles within him. He sees that he doesn't even the priest doesn't even know himself. And he denies him as a mentor. It's unbelievable. Now we go to Megan's sister. The pure and holy. And I quote from page 87. We waited to see whether she would remain or go in. And if she remained, we left our shadows and walked up to Megan's steps rescindedly. Now, no one waits for anybody unless they know they're going to receive something. And obviously, if she's gonna be a nun, he ain't receiving anything, you know what I'm saying? So, he's seen her as a mentor. And that's a little bit of a different look at the Catholic Church. Because they don't believe that women can lead. But for some reason, this boy thinks she can. And I think James Joyce is trying to tell us that, hey, the way we're looking at things, we should probably let some other people lead, if you know what I'm saying. But let's go ahead and go on to divorcing the holiness of the Catholic Church. Joyce destroys the trope of holiness within Catholicism through the protagonist's incessant parade of himself and his calling to the priesthood. Yeah, boy thinks he's gonna be a priest. Like I said, he looked at the priest as, as some sort of mentor. Why not? So the three things we're gonna be looking at are the books, the Arabic, we have the memoirs of the Cool, and then the devout communicant. Let's move on to the Arabic. It's a story of a queen of Scotland that was seen as the Harlot Queen horror name, right? Which we have a priest by the name of Father Ambrose, who was no longer part of the priesthood. I don't know why, but he isn't. He tries to help the queen recover her freedom. Now, why is this priest reading these type of stories? It's nonfiction, I get it. Yeah, maybe he was interested. But no, they're not supposed to be reading anything but the Bible, right? This priest is struggling with something inward, the carnal man. He's not holding the qualifications of a cloth, so he's looking for some other source. He's having to maintain this purity and failing. He's searching for some type of redemption, unable to forgive himself. 
You know, the priests are the ones that are mediators between Christ and us, right? And now we have the Manyars of Vatical, okay? So, in this novel, it's about a police commissioner that fights with an inner struggle. The upholding of the law and him being a thief as well. Once again, we have this look at this, this law-abiding man that is also fighting with his inner struggle of going against the law. Now, I got from a reputable source, it's got the B24. And I quote, there is meaning in the mention of this book. He, the crucial themes of the story, namely that of deception. That of deception. So, as we know, this priest is supposed to be a devout man. He's called by God to be a priest. And yet, he's struggling with these immoral things, trying to figure out some way to get around it. He's deceiving the church. I don't know. He dies. I, I, I didn't say what happened. I don't know. It doesn't say it. I'm not reading that far into it. You know what I'm saying? But it's a line of good and evil. The struggle. The problem of the carnal man. Like I said, I think it's deep. Now we have one book that is seemingly doesn't exist. The Devout Community. There's multiple books that are called this. That are from the priest. And that are from the Vatican or from everywhere. I mean, it's just, this is not specific enough to be able to get into it. But just from the title, you can see that he struggled with being devout. Now we can go into different things. We can see what kind of problems are going. But he seemed to have a problem with this calling. We gotta figure it out. So once again, it's a struggle with morality with this priest. Man, we, James Joyce is showing us the true Thing of the Catholic Church and how it has this this pure look on the inside sorry on the outside it's pure look you go on the inside whitewash too that's what he's saying he's getting down and dirty he doesn't outwardly say it but he definitely says it deep down in the narratives now here's a real exciting one societal expectation on children and rushing them through their childhood now we're gonna see some binary opposition within this and it's gonna be exciting we have the narrative is portrayed as a coming of age story. We see it. But the author uses the seemingly monotonous flow of the plot. And it's predictable, excuse, excuse me, it's predictability to cause a twist to show the need to keep the protagonist in his current state as a boy. Now, we have two binary oppositions. We have the uncle and the aunt saying one thing. We have the priest and the nun saying another. Okay, so uncle and the priest they're the guardians of the childhood the aunt and megan's sister the nun forces the child to become and go into the adulthood now this is the interesting part pay attention the uncle on page nine and i quote in the arabi he says he believed in the old saying all work no play makes the jack a dull boy now men have a problem with expressing themselves we see time and time out. I'm doing it right now. I have a problem with expressing myself. But he does it in a way that he can. All work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. He's calling out to this kid saying, you need to see what you have right now. You need to see it. You need to take hold of it. And you need to cherish it as long as you have it. Because once you hit adulthood, done. All work, no play. Now we have another person the priest the see if you can see what i'm i'm it's setting up here james joyce is showing us this these men are trying to hold this boy in his childhood the priest goes into the difficulties of purity and moral acts and i quote from page 86 the wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling branches under one of which i found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. Now we gotta we gotta look deep into this because most of you guys skipped that part. And you guys didn't understand that part. You need to pay attention because it's in there. It's in there. Now the apple tree. This is coming from the priest. He had it and he's got it. This is looked at as a Bible as the tree of good and evil. The knowledge of it. And what happened in the garden? Eve ate the apple, gave it to Adam. Now he has to work and slave and he has sin now. So these immoral acts are now pushed upon him. And one more thing that we see, one more thing. I know it sounds funny, but the rusty bicycle pump. Why did he mention that? 
What is a bicycle pump? I know, it's the pump of tires of bikes. Things you do as a kid. Man, George, you got something going. And it's deep in there, but you gotta pay attention. We're gonna move to the forces of moving the child to adulthood. We have the hand. From page 89 of James Joyce's therapy, and I quote, my aunt said to him, energetically, can't you give him the money and let him go? This is when he was going to go to the bazaar. The key things we need to pay attention to. Yes, money, a root of all kinds of evil. I get it. Yes, Bible, blah. But let him go. Whenever you're speaking about letting things go, it's about love. One, when you let the love go, and it'll come back if it's meant to be, whatever. But it's about letting him go like the child. You're supposed to let him adventure and become an adult and understand these bigger things. Hey, it's the aunt. We got the binary route opposition from the uncle to the aunt. One saying, keep your childhood. The other saying, go adventure and find out adulthood. Man, Joyce, what are you doing to us? Now we have Megan's sister, the nun. <laughs> it just gets crazier for me. I got two quotes for me. Page 87, James Joyce Araby. And I quote, I just swung as she moved her body and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. No one thinks of that and it's like, oh, yeah, he, he was seeing that holiness on her. No. It's just kind of, uh, I hate to say seductive, you know. <laughs> Come on. But let's get back to that. But he's, she's calling him to venture off into this love type, affectionate, immoral practices. There's none, right? And that's the horrible part because that's when you venture into those adulthoods and you start getting those struggles. And once you do it, you cannot not do it again. So I don't know what she's doing. And then we got from another one from 87. And I quote, she asked me, was I going to the Arabi? It would be a splendid bazaar. She said she would love to go. It is well for you, she said. Man, she's calling him out, telling him to go venture off and to find his adulthood. To find his meaning in life. He's just a kid. She's older than him. She's probably been down the block. I mean, she's going to be on, I don't know. But... What is going on? We have the priests showing us what the immoral adults do and the struggles of trying to be pure and unable to. You know, being a child, you're the purest as you're going to get. And then you have the nun telling him to go and venture and discover himself. James Joyce, you got it right when you wrote this. All this in a short story. Thanks for stopping in. I hear them peeping. They're coming in. So I gotta go. You guys keep inspiring.